this is what a Toledo sword looks like when it's finished. This particular one is modeled on the sword that Pissarro carried. It's a fearsome weapon. It's used for stabbing, and it's also used for slashing, and I can easily understand how the person wielding the sword could kill dozens of people within a short time. Swords like this, rapiers, represented a high point in a very sophisticated metalworking technology. If you think about what the qualities are that are needed in a sword, first of all, it has to be hard enough, the metal has to be hard enough to take a sharp edge. And that requires steel, that is iron infused with carbon. And the more carbon you put into the iron, then the harder the metal is. But if you make it too hard, then it's brittle. And that's no good because as you hit somebody, your sword would break. And so you also need your sword to have a certain pliability, an ability to bend and spring back into shape. And it's got by heating it to certain temperatures, plunging it into cold water, immense amount of experimentation. It took centuries to get to the level of sophistication where you could get something so long and elegant and fine and deadly as the rapier. The rapier, with its extra long blade, was developed as a dueling weapon, but became so fashionable in Renaissance Europe, it was the sword of choice for any aspiring gentleman. The word rapier derives from the Spanish term espada ropera, and that means dress sword. And for the first time in Spain, we start to see people wearing the sword with their everyday clothing, their civilian dress, going about their everyday business. They didn't do that in the Middle Ages. This is something new in the 16th century. And it's saying, I have arrived, I am a gentleman, I am upwardly mobile, and I claim ancestry from the knights of the Middle Ages. It was very much a symbol of the conquistadors aspiring greed the thing that drove them through all their hardships, the thing that made them go to the Americas was their lust for gold, their lust for self-advancement. And the rapier absolutely symbolized that overbearing avarice. On November 15th, 1532, Pizarro's band of adventurers enters the valley of Cajamarca. They've been told that Atahualpa is waiting for them here. But they're not prepared for the sight that greets them. In the hills beyond the town of Cajamarca is the Imperial Inca army, 80,000 men in full battle order. The conquistadors' own journals bear witness to their first impressions. Their camp looked like a very beautiful city, which seemed nothing like it in the Indies until then. And it scared us, because we were so few and so deep in this land. Pizarro sends a party of his best horsemen into the heart of the Inca camp. They are led by Captain de Soto. They are gambling that Atahualpa will allow them to pass through the camp unharmed and agree to meet them. Soto's visit had a very important psychological purpose. To intimidate the Inca in front of his people, challenging him with the horse. El gobernador de Perú, Don Francisco Pizarro, Atahualpa at first didn't react to Soto's presence, as if nobody had entered the room. Once the the horse comes eye to eye with the Inca, the Inca is still calm, showing that the horse has no impact on him. 
calling Soto's bluff. The captain advanced so close that the horse's nostrils disturbed the fringe on the Inca's forehead. But the Inca never moved. And then, after a brief silence, comes Atahualpa's explosion. He was telling them, the time has come for you to pay. I understand this as the time has come for you to pay with your lives. Soto, I understand, was uh, nervous enough to come back with fear to the uh, camp. And as we know, the Spaniards spent the night before in extreme fear. The conquistadors have made their camp in the town of Cajamarca. Many of them are now convinced they are facing oblivion. 168 soldiers, a thousand miles from any other Spaniard, facing an army of 80,000 Incas. Few of us slept that night. We kept watch in the square, from where we could see the campfires of the Indian army. It was a fearful sight, like a brilliantly star-studded night. Pizarro and his most trusted officers debate their options for how to deal with Atahualpa. Some advise caution, but Pizarro insists their best chance is to launch a surprise attack the next day. It's a tactic that's worked successfully in the past. Twelve years before Pizarro went to Peru, another famous conquistador, Hernán Cortés, had gone to Mexico and encountered another formidable civilization, the Aztecs. He conquered the country by kidnapping the Aztec leader and exploiting the ensuing chaos. Cortés's story was later published and became a bestseller a handbook for any would-be conquistador. It can still be found in the great library of Salamanca University in northern Spain. This wonderful library here can be thought of, among other things, as a repository of dirty tricks because in these books are the accounts of what generals had been doing to other generals for thousands of years in the past and across much of Eurasia. And here from this library we have a famous account of the conquest of Mexico with all the details of what Cortes did to the Aztecs and what worked. Um, that was a model for Pissarro to give him ideas what exactly to try out on the Incas. Whereas the Incas, without writing had only local knowledge transmitted by oral memory and they were unsophisticated and naive compared to the Spaniards because of writing. But if books were so useful, why couldn't the Incas read or write? To develop a new system of writing independently is an extremely complex process and has happened very rarely in human history. It was first achieved by the Sumerian people of the Fertile Crescent at least 5,000 years ago. They pioneered an elaborate system of symbols called cuneiform, possibly as a way of recording farming transactions. Ever since, almost every other written language of Europe and Asia has copied adapted, or simply been inspired by the basics of cuneiform. The spread of writing was helped enormously by the invention of paper 